Um, our next event has become a uh, tradition uh, in that we have what I consider a grand debate. So I'd like uh, Dr. Wazer and Dr. Vidia to come on up uh, to the stage and take a seat as I go through some introductory slides. Now, I'm sure that uh, these two gentlemen have pre been preparing for their debate, but I can tell you, as you'll see shortly, um, I spent over a week preparing my introductory slides, so I'm going to apologize ahead of time to our guest from London because um, there, there's a, uh, I think they're funny. I don't know that it's going to go over. Uh, there's a quote uh, by, I think it's Dr. Harry Menken, that says that uh, a man can be a fool and not know it, except if he is married. And, and my wife's not here, and she hasn't looked over my slides, so these may not be as funny as I, as I think they are. But I had a dilemma. We knew we wanted to do a debate, and I had a dilemma. dilemma. And I just started out trying to put it together. I already had a problem. I didn't know what the hot topic was. Um, so uh, it came across that we needed to have a debate with intraop radiotherapy versus we're going to call it post-op uh, APBI. Um, who better than to present IORT than Dr. Uh, Wydea? And I'm going to say Mr. I think we call the physicians in, in London Mr. Well, no, not physicians. Surgeons in London are Mr. Okay. But my title now is Professor. Okay. Well, <laughs> I have Mr. on here. I may have a couple doctors in his introductory, but we'll call him Professor uh, Wydea. Uh, and he's a respected surgical colleague, familiar with the ABS. He's, he's spoken in our meeting in the past. Um, he's a lead author of a phase three trial. Um, so I, I put out an invitation. And, and I did warn him about the style of this debate. <laughs> and he accepted. But I had a second dilemma. Who is going to represent post-op APBI? Could I really ask David Wazer again to debate? He did such a great job last year, but you have to understand there's a history. Now, a couple of years ago, I introduced him um, in the shootout at What's Not Okay with APBI Corral. This was a debate between breaking an external beam. We were up in Canada. Um, we had Dr. Wazer uh, debating Dr. Alphonse Tagen, and Dr. Wazer, in his typical style, took Dr. Tagen down at his knees. I had it all set up as a Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, and, and of course they came in and, and had a great debate. Um, uh, David clearly the winner, and I don't think Dr. We've heard from Dr. Uh, taking again after the <laughs> debate. Um, last year at this event we had the main event. Um, it was to sear or not to sear. I got lectured by Dr. Ben Smith how it wasn't sear data, but um, and and we had Dr. Wazer again debating and defending PBI against uh, Dr. Uh, ben Smith. We had that set up as a, as a boxing event, and of course we had the two giants boxing, and they did a fantastic job, and, and Dr. Wazer again um, has come out the victor, but I, of course we continue to hear from Dr. Ben Smith, so maybe, maybe Dr. Wazer didn't put him down quite hard enough, but it was a great debate. Now, I needed a man of steel for this debate. I mean, IORT is gaining popularity, and, and, and there's some things that Dr. Wydea says, we've got questions, and I, I just didn't know if I had a man of steel that I could really count on. Well, here you have Professor Wydea, um, very pleasant uh, fellow that graciously accepted, and he was jubilant, absolutely jubilant, <laughs> happy to come to America, and we couldn't wait. But surprisingly, I didn't know what else to do. I went to the man of steel, and yes, Dr. Wazer agreed to come. Now, he was very sheepish. He was very shy. He wasn't sure what he was going to do <laughs> with this, uh, but he was willing to join in. But how am I going to set this debate up? So I did some thinking, and I had a snack. Now, I don't know where I got this picture, but and I, so I had a snack, <laughs> and I thought about it, and I started thinking, we're a little bit paranoid. In post-op APBI world, we've been working on this for 20 years, all of a sudden Intrabeam comes along. Is it out to destroy the world of post-op APBI? Does, does Professor Vidia have a <laughs> missile that's ready to launch? 
Did his device not look like a destructive missile? Was it ready to launch? Was it Mr. Vidya from England? Was he, in fact, our Dr. Evil out to destroy <laughs> post op APDI? <laughs> So perhaps it wasn't Superman that I really needed. Maybe I needed Dr. David Danger Wizard. <laughs> and yes, he did agree. And he's out to debate Dr. Evil Wydea. <laughs> so this is the debate of intra-op versus post-op APBI. One shot, sure, why not? Featuring these two gentlemen uh, that will go at it. Now, Dr. Wazer will represent post-op APBI, and he's here to save the world from evil, and attempting to destroy the world of post-op <laughs> APBI will be Dr. Professor Wydea. Now, I am the referee of this match. I am going to be fair and impartial. If we have a problem and it's getting too rough, I, uh, if, if Dr. Wydea is having difficulties, um, I will um, uh, quickly approach him and I'll give him a very short, brief moment to consult with his sidekick, and we'll move on. If Dr. Wazer is having difficulties, we'll give him some time. We'll allow him to go through it, and he can consult with his <laughs> sidekick for as long as he would like. So this is the format. I finished my five-minute introduction. I hope you all have learned a lot from that. Um, we will give 20 minutes first to Professor Vidya, and then we will give 20 minutes to Dr. Uh, Danger Wazer. And then, uh, if there's any questions, any clarity, we'll give a brief couple of questions if anything comes up. If not, then we'll go into rebuttal, again, first with Professor Wydea and then uh, Dr. Wazer. If we have questions, great. And then we'll have a decision at the end on uh, who won the battle. So I will immediately go to Professor Wydea. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have mine on. You don't buy weapons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this um, opportunity. Um, so, we all know that in war, no one wins. So, that is my first point. We are not at war. <laughs> okay, so this is, a, this is the only scientific slide in this, um, is why may a target be superior? Firstly, fractionated EBRT, you can have a geographical miss, and in some studies, up to 80%. And here, we give it accurately to the right place. You don't have to bother about size of the wire, where it gets stuck. It's there in front of you. You have the tumor bed. You give it there and then. There is no, I just was, throughout the first two talks, I was like, oh, why, why do all this? Okay, the second. And you must remember that this session, you're allowed to say uh, things in an exaggerated way. So don't take my word as a sacrosanct now. Number two, there is tumor cell proliferation. Before you start radiotherapy, in the first four or five days, all the body fluid is there to make the wound heal. Fantastic for tumor cells. They start growing, multiplying, spreading around the body. Target, you give it at the time of surgery. Deliver all together in one go. No time to proliferate between doses. It alters tumor microenvironment, as you saw yesterday. And we did some sophisticated mathematical modeling which suggests that fewer fractions may actually be better. And start trial results show 40 fractions do better than 50. Now 40 gray in fewer fractions does better than 50. And uh, so that is the first slide. Second, now these are the answers. I'll give you 12 reasons why target, I was getting into 13 and 14, but I said, well, that's a bit too much for David to defend. So let's just do 12, a dozen. Why target during lumpectomy should become the standard of care for selected patients? Firstly, the most importantly, we are all here for patients, not for the machines. We are here because it is convenient for patients. They finish their treatment. Instead of having a diagnosis of cancer, removal of cancer, systemic therapy, and go back every day for a few weeks or a few days even, why? Just finish it at the time of surgery, all done. Convenient for the patient, number one. Number two, it's easier on the patients. So we have data on quality of life, on satisfaction, and cosmesis. So Frederick Wenz has done studies which shows less pain, fewer breast and arm symptoms, higher patient satisfaction. Mokeshka has done studies which has found in improvement in cosmetic outcome in patients who receive target compared to external beam. And uh, we have found that when external beam patients are compared to target patients, there is less persistent breast pain. 
Third, target is less expensive for the community. Now here the important point is community. It is less expensive for the community, not necessarily that it makes more money or less money to the provider. So that is a point that I don't want to discuss in open debate. So <laughs> I'll leave that at that. But cost effectiveness, I had done the study in 2004 and Michael Alvarado did this study from UCSF and the paper I've realized it just published in September is that if the United States of America does not adopt target with Interbeam, I may say so, then the US burden to the economy is $1.4 billion over the next five years. Can the US afford this? Just for breast cancer, for some selected patients of breast cancer. Well, maybe you can, but maybe the uh, <coughs> US can't. And under Obamacare, I don't know the politics of Obamacare much, but under Obamacare, if a particular treatment is as effective and is half the cost, clearly that is what should be prepared. Number four, it's relatively simple to deliver. Even a surgeon can do it. So that's the machine, that's the how it is done. This is a 19 second video. Can you start the video, please? So it's a simple technique. You have no need of a CT scan. So I don't know how many new cancers have been created during the planning of savvy devices with so many CTs done every day, every day. No CT scan here. You open the wound is open, you put an applicator, make sure everything is right, the whole surface is opposed to the applicator, make sure skin is a centimeter away, and it's finished. 25 minutes, you go and have a coffee, otherwise surgeons never leave the operation theater when the patient is on table, so this is one opportunity for us. Okay, number five, it was devised by clinicians, surgeons and radiation oncologists working together, tested by clinician, trialists, and patients. So that is Professor Baum, Professor Tobias, and me when I was a little, and this is a group of international uh, clinicians and surgeons and physicists and patients and pathologists who have uh, divide, uh, done this. Target is quicker. It's all finished during the lumpectomy. It adds between 20 to 45 minutes to the lumpectomy time. It is individualized. It is not a dogma that you have to use only target. You're allowed and we have proven it is safe to add external beam if there is any clinical doubt postoperatively. The idea here is not to dogmatically say only this patient should have this, no. If you find there is extensive lymphovascular invasion, if you have multiple positive nodes, add external beam radiotherapy. Although it did not occur in all our patients in the target trial, despite the protocol, only half of the people with adverse factors got external beam, but we have, we have that option. So it's a mobile unit. It is given accurately, as I said before, there is no geographical miss, unless the surgeon doesn't remove the tumor and leaves it behind. So we have the first case performed in 1998. It's done in the right place. There is no temporal miss, as I said. It is done immediately after lumpectomy. It is time tested. It has been going on since 1998. It is not new. It has been there for a long time, and it didn't, um, so there is a long 15 years. 2nd of July, 98. Luckily, someone had a digital camera in 1998, so we got a picture of that patient. And to say the least, target, target has randomized evidence to support it. So here is a headline result. When target is given at the time of lumpectomy, there is no difference in local recurrence, and there are fewer deaths. Overall survival is, appears to be larger, and the results are stable across cohorts of patients who have got longer and longer follow-up. So you can see here that the first cohort, these are the patients who are hormone receptor positive. You can see that the patients with median follow-up of five years, a large number, still has the same, no difference in local recurrence, and a 3.1% improvement in survival. So finally, target saves time, saves money, press, and now this is a new one that it probably does save lives. So you can see here patients who have target at the time of lumpectomy, no difference in local recurrence on top, no difference in breast cancer death, but importantly, significant reduction in non-breast cancer mortality at this time. It doesn't look like these, these lines are going to start crossing each other at some point in the future. 
So these are the 12 reasons that I've given, and I think I've taken less than 12 minutes to say so. so. Um, and I've recognized that the meeting has been arranged, and I will never doubt um, any of the organizers that they have already seen my slides, so prepared their talk based on that. So, <laughs> so, that, is, so that advantage, uh, I will not say that they have. Uh, I think, I don't know whether I have five minutes, or I could have a little longer time for the rebuttal, because I don't know what you're going to say. I, there will be time at the, it, there will be more than five minutes at the end, okay. it, uh, certainly. Okay. So there I will give you a reasons why we should use APBI. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Wazer. Well, Jay, that uh, was a great uh, presentation. <coughs> and thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank for, you. For thank you very much. That is, thank you. Um, <laughs> honestly, I was sitting there, and, uh, and I, I wasn't control. quite sure whether there's even any point getting up to, to debate. Oh, I, uh, God. That's okay, then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you've got me in a deep hole here, and, uh, and you know, it's, I really wonder why are we even here uh, today? Um, you know, here's a Bob Kusky's patient from 20-some-odd years ago, and, you know, 64-year-old woman, small primary, favorable features, node negative, margins negative. And here, you and I both agree, yeah. this patient does not need whole breast radiation therapy. Yeah. So we agree on this. Absolutely. <laughs> so why, the, why are we having this fight? I mean, <laughs> you know, the sick Doug no, Arthur, is, you know, sort of picks this fight. Isn't this all just different forms of accelerated partial breast radiation? I mean, okay. I think we agree. Absolutely. So, you know, maybe this is just a transatlantic <laughs> misunderstanding <laughs> of, uh, you know, people separated by a common language. Uh, and, you know, I say tomato, you say tomato. Potato, potato. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> I think the question this morning really has to be, um, can't we all just get along? Oh, yes. Um, can you we say, can, can we get along? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, That's how I started. <laughs> I appreciate that, because... No, we can't. <laughs> and why we can't is that APBI with brachytherapy is clearly superior to a single fraction of intraoperative radiotherapy. And these are the nails that will be placed in your coffin this morning uh, related to pathologic anatomy, biology, the theory versus reality, dosimetry, which, uh, boy, this is going to be fun, and practicality, just uh, the implementation of intraop. And then, uh, really, the lethal thing is that brachytherapy works, intra-op doesn't. <laughs> so uh, let's start with the pathologic anatomy and the recognition over many, many decades that pathologic anatomy is the guide to successful local therapy. So what is the pathologic anatomy of early breast cancer? And this is pretty well studied. I mean, this is something that we have a lot of data around. And we think of the pathologic anatomy as uh, basically of four types, with the last type, the D type, uh, being the most rare, that is true multicentric disease. Early breast cancer, by and large, we have an index primary cancer with some surrounding microscopic disease uh, to varying extent. And that varying extent really is related to the ductal anatomy of the breast. And this is what results in the multifocality of cancer and why we see residual disease. And that ductal anatomy is enormously complex. So that makes this residual disease uh, sometimes very complex in its distribution. And we see that here in this whole mount specimen, the red dot being the index primary cancer. And the little black dots there are the specks of residual disease, primarily intraductal disease, but there can be some invasive disease scattered about as well. And you can see that unpredictable distribution uh, through a lumpectomy specimen uh, and uh, also looking at the eccentric placement of the index cancer relative to that residual disease. Now, how, what do we use to assess that risk, that risk of residual disease? Well, we look at margin assessment, and margin assessment is a crude but reliable indicator of what is that risk of residual disease. And we've known for decades that as we look at margin assessment, 
and this is going to be dependent on a few different factors, primarily the age of the patient, but also the extent or proximity of the margin as to what is the risk of residual cancer in the breast. And we think of this in the context of, uh, in patients without extensive intraductal component, as a pretty linear correlation between the extent of margin involvement uh, related to risk of residual disease as a function of age. Uh, when we see extensive intraductal component, that, that uh, age dependence sort of disappears, as does uh, the reliance on margin to be able to give us uh, an accurate assessment of risk. So we think of, broadly speaking, pathologic anatomy as age dependent with what I refer to as youngish patients under the age of 50 having a higher risk of residual disease and perhaps a broader geographic uh, distribution and older patients a little bit less so. And this has panned out through decades of clinical trial work. And here in one example is the EORTC boost trial and pathologic anatomy is completely supported by the clinical results, both in terms of the age dependence with respect to the baseline risk of recurrence after whole breast radiation therapy, as well as the influence of that quadrant-specific therapy, in this case being boost. So the concept of pathologic anatomy has been validated again and again. And uh, this is a first for me. Um, I'm not a fan of Harry Bartolink, but here I am. I'm going to quote him. Um, he actually made a very good point recently. As we've looked at the progression of clinical trials in breast conserving therapy, looking at whole breast radiation therapy and lumpectomy over a span of 30 years, and as we have paid more attention to the pathologic anatomy of breast cancer, surgeons, radiation oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists, uh, we have seen the local failure rate that we achieve in these clinical trials dramatically decrease. Pathologic anatomy guides local therapy. So what uh, constitutes the appropriate target delineation for any form of partial breast radiation? Well, we come back to Bob's patient. Here we are with a, a, a favorable <coughs> breast cancer, do a lumpectomy, and where do we target? Is it the lumpectomy cavity, or is it where the residual disease sits? And who is to say that that residual disease is in some way a symmetric distribution around the lumpectomy cavity? We know that's not the case. We know that by virtue of the anatomy of the breast, the ductal anatomy of the breast. So when we look at this uh, in some detail, and uh, the variety of different uh, detailed pathologic uh, studies, and very, very careful uh, sectioning and mapping of where this residual disease is in the breast, uh, we get a pretty accurate picture as to what that risk is, not only of residual disease, but how far is that residual disease from the index primary lesion. And in this case, with, slightly, with a, a broader range of tumors, including some more locally advanced cancers, we can see that extent of residual disease extending out as far as two and a half centimeters. But more contemporary data, and these are very, very large series, uh, Frank Ficini and his group looked at patients who were appropriate for APBI, and they, all, they looked at what is the appropriate target volume. And that appropriate target volume, pretty reliably, uh, had to be with a 10 millimeter margin. Uh, and it was, I think, again, very critical that this was consistent with all the prior data that this risk was dependent on margin proximity. So as you, you had to take into that account, into account related to whether or not that 10 millimeter width was really an adequate uh, target volume. A similar study from Australia found essentially the same thing uh, and identified other variables including age, menopausal status, uh, margin positivity and tumor size. So that's where we come to this target definition concept that guides brachytherapy APBI. We have a tumor with some residual disease. We have a uh, the ideal target to cover all of that, that cancer. We have a surgery that typically will be eccentric uh, with respect to the location of the cancer and its relationship to that residual disease. And we have definition of target volume. Our European colleagues use that margin information to weight the distribution of their dose in their implant constructs. 
In the United States, we tend to use the lumpectomy cavity with a broader margin uh, to essentially accomplish the same thing, covering the same uh, target volume. Now, brachytherapy works. We've got 20 years of clinical trial data to support that. And we look at that implant construct as a function of pathologic anatomy. And we get remarkably good results. Uh, this is a well-tolerated procedure, excellent cosmetic outcome, uh, excellent functional results. And we have long-term follow-up data. Uh, here uh, uh, for brachytherapy, uh, we have patients now com coming to 20 years of follow-up, uh, not only uh, with excellent local control, but excellent cosmetic outcome. We have randomized trial data supporting uh, that this is as good as whole breast radiation therapy, and we, ha we are awaiting the results of major prospective randomized trials, both in North America and in Europe, uh, looking at this concept of post-op, brachytherapy, pathologic anatomy-driven therapy. So now along comes target. So for 30, 40 years, we've been managing breast cancer based on these principles. Have we been doing it wrong the whole time? Now, in contrast to brachytherapy, the dosimetry of target simply makes no sense. And here we have the distribution of a, 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 brachytherapy, a brachytherapy applicator with iridium, the manocyte applicator. And the red line is the prescription point. And you see that one centimeter distance from the applicator surface gets 34 gray and 10 fractions. That's a tumoricidal dose. Contrast that to a 50 kV source, an applicator uh, like the intrabeam device. At that same point, that same point in the breast, you get five gray in one fraction. That's simply inadequate to control cancer. Now, this is my favorite slide that uh, Dr. Vajja showed, uh, I'm sorry, Professor uh, <laughs> uh, shows. Um, and um, he, he says, well, that's okay. We use that sharp dose fall off uh, associated with the intrabeam device um, to account for where the residual disease is. So as the dose, you don't need that much dose as you get further away because you have so few tumor cells. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I got to give you a little lesson in radiation biology. Radiation kills cells in a stochastic probabilistic manner. It kills cells. The same fraction of cells are killed, irrespective of the number of cells that are there. So if the radiation dose kills 90% of cells, it will kill 90% of a million cells or 90% of 10 cells. That never varies. And that's why we see radiation survival curves that invariably show in the semi-logarithmic plot with a very, very sensitive cell line, if you look at five gray, you get about a two log reduction in tumor burden, two logs. Now, what does that translate? Well, if a tumor is microscopically visible, and I've already shown you data that at one centimeter, at least 50% of patients in one analysis had microscopically visible tumor cells. That's at least a million tumor cells per cc of tissue. So if you're looking at a million tumor cells, that five gray uh, is simply going to be inadequate to eradicate that, that residual burden. So if the dosimetry must, makes no sense, there must be something magical about the beam itself, that maybe the radiobiological effectiveness of this beam is so much more potent than iridium uh, uh, could be. And in fact, when we look at very, very low energy x-rays, which is what this is, in fact, this 50 kV source, that's the peak energy, the average energy that comes off of it is about 28 kV. Now, for the non-radiation oncologists in the room, that's very close to basically a diagnostic x-ray beam. And that beam does have properties, some uh, biological properties, that does make it a little bit more toxic to cells compared to megavoltage irradiation. 
megavoltage coming out of a linear accelerator. Now, this RBE relationship is dependent not just on the energy you're comparing it against, but also the dose per fraction. So if we look at 3.4 gray, uh, if that were being given also with a intrabeam device at 3.4 gray, you would see an RBE of probably about 1.5, so about a 50% dose enhancement. But if you look at where, intra, where uh, uh, the target trial is at 20 gray, that RBE enhancement is trivial. It's 1.2 at best. So then we have to say, well, if the dosimetry and the beam properties don't make sense, is there something unique about this biology? Is there a special biology associated with intraop therapy? And um, we saw in uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Wyge's uh, uh, pr presentation yesterday uh, this theory that this magically irradiated tissue juice somehow redefines the biology of tumor recurrence. The cells wiggle less, I think. <laughs> um, this is an unproven theory, and it's demonstrated only in tissue culture, never shown in vivo, never. So what actually happens in breast tissue after a single large dose of radiation therapy? Well, you don't have to look far. There's actually, this has been studied quite a bit. I'm just going to use one paper as an example. This one was relatively recently published. Uh, sort of an interesting study. Takes a mouse, does a surgical wound in the breast, takes a little breast tissue out, um, randomly allocates to radiation, single fraction radiation at 20 gray, interestingly enough, and then retransplants back in uh, normal breast epithelium from a P53 null mice. That's basically a genetically unstable breast epithelium. And tumors develop both in the, that operative bed, because that operative bed is tumorigenic, uh, as well as in, patient, in uh, the mice that were irradiated. The interesting thing, though, is that single fraction of radiation reduced the latency with which these tumors would form, though, so they'd form quicker with radiation to the tumor bed, increased tumor formation, promoted aggressive tumor growth, and increased estrogen receptor negative tumors, and uh, massively stimulated uh, tumorigenic cytokines. So that massive single fraction of irradiation to the tumor bed in this biological model was the worst possible thing you could do. What's the practical reality associated with the implementation of intraop radiotherapy? Well, um, if you go to the operating room, you don't really know fully what's the histology of the tumor, type grade, LVI, et cetera. What are the margins? And don't tell me the frozen section is going to tell you what a final margin is. It is not. And you don't know what the axillary lymph node status is. Just don't know. So what if you guess wrong? Well, off they go to external beam. Well, so what's the big deal? If you guess wrong, you fix it with external beam. That's what the inevitable late consequence will be. Symptomatic fat necrosis. That's the complication when you overdose the breast. And uh, I'm sure Jay will say, well, we don't see that. Well, that's because he's got such short follow-up. It's only a matter of time, and it will show up. And this was a lesson we learned early in the brachytherapy experience. If you have dose hotspots of sufficient volume and that big applicator, that big intraoperative applicator, that is sufficient volume, uh, will have an inevitable late consequence. This being fat necrosis uh, develops over a period of, of many years and continues to develop with further follow-up. So, Jay, we have an expression in the United States, shooting fish in a barrel. Are you familiar with that? Well, that's, that's, what, that's about what I'm going to do here. <laughs> shooting fish in a barrel is when it's, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's so easy um, that there's no effort involved whatsoever. And this is what's going to happen right now. The interest op story is rapidly beginning to unravel. <clears throat> Let's start with Jay's colleagues in Italy uh, with the Elliott trial. Different uh, technique, uh, but basically the same principle. If anything, it makes a little bit more sense to me than the target trial because it treats a larger volume of tissue. I mean, it, it seems to make a little bit more sense from a pathologic anatomy standpoint, but still a large single fraction of radiation. Uh, they also have run a randomized study, uh, pretty good follow-up on their study, uh, by the way. 
And look at the results. Well, fat necrosis, and this is not you know, little specks on a mammogram. This is fat necrosis, symptomatic fat necrosis, 12% of patients. And this is with no additional whole breast radiation therapy. Just what we predicted. But here we go, our five-year epsilateral recurrence rate compared to conventional whole breast radiation, six-fold difference. Let's look at Jay's results. We have the paper published in Lancet uh, a few years back. No difference. Last year, he presented uh, his updated result. Again, median follow-up on this cohort, less than two and a half years. Significant difference in local. Look at the second line, though. <laughs> but Jay, you're in good country. You're, you're in good company. Just look at that. Our colleagues around the world that have looked at ITRA uh, basically seen the same thing. So, you know, it's okay. You've, you've got company. And here at UNC, uh, here they give their uh, single fraction pre-op, interestingly enough, What's local this? failure rate 8% in three years. Sloan Kettering has been using a modified ham applicator for a number of years, similar dose prescription, local failure rate 7%, once again, high rate of fat necrosis with long follow-up. So what works for APBI? Clearly, it's brachytherapy. Why brachytherapy? Because brachytherapy takes into account the pathologic anatomy of breast cancer. It understands the target that we need to treat. The dosimetry makes sense with respect to that, bi that pathologic anatomy. The biology, we know, and we know it works, and we have good long-term clinical data to show the tolerability of it. So, one shot. I think we know where that all winds up, and uh, I would urge that we not. <laughs> Are there any uh, comments or questions from the audience that you would like to see addressed in the rebuttal? Well, good. I think so far was great. I want to thank everybody for coming. No, just kidding. The, uh, we have a rebuttal from uh, Professor Vaidya. So I'll use up some of the time I saved in the previous ones because I've got a few points. Um, what I find, uh, would like to quote, uh, I can't remember who said it, is firstly, breast cancer didn't come to listen to the biology and the uh, dosimetry and everything else from every patient. I wish breast cancer would come here and listen to all that theory because it is an extreme misfortune and tragedy when the theory outstrips the experiment. So the only randomized evidence for the APBI with uh, brachytherapy is 258 patients. Yes, median follow-up of 258 patients is maybe five years or six years, but target trial has 1,200 patients with a median follow-up of five years, over 600 patients who have a minimum follow-up of more than five years. So there is long follow-up here. Number two, age has never reduced the reduction in uh, mortality, reduction in proportional reduction in effect of radiotherapy. Even in the EORTC study, there was a reduction in um, recurrence of a boost with age. It was less in older people because the background recurrence rate was less, but the proportional reduction was the same. So don't let that, those diagrams <laughs> fool you. That, those are diagrams of histological specimens and not tumor cells which always grow. You know, 80% of men at the age of 80 have cancers in their prostate, but patients, the men don't die from prostate cancer, they die with it. It is something similar for breast. And we have, yesterday you saw randomized evidence, which found, in fact, other quadrant cancers don't grow, even with 2,500 women years of follow-up. So let us not get fooled with what we see under the microscope. What is in front of you is a real woman, for whom the cancer cells may look like cancer but not always grow, just like such a lot of overdiagnosis that happens when you do screening mammography. Now, as you say, residual disease, I found it very interesting that residual disease is present in 50% of patients beyond the margin of excision. That was fantastic statistics. Because in, if that was the case, Kevin Hughes' study where no radiotherapy was given, normal excisions were done, what happened to the 50% of patients of this residual disease? That residual disease is not relevant. Only eight or 9% patients got recurrences. And those were near the quadrant, most of them, at the quadrant, at the scar. 
It is near the scar that is important. It is the wounding, near the wounding that the recurrence occurs. Other quadrant recurrences are same as the other breast. I think the best option might be to start treating bilateral whole breast radiotherapy if you want to treat every residual cancer cell in the breast or treat the whole, whole body because there may be some residual tumor cells in the thyroid. Many of us have thyroid occult cancers. Uh, yes, I, it was interesting to see that. Thank you for explaining how the BED is better for uh, target and how the, uh, Professor Frederick Wenz has done very nice biological uh, models which show how the equivalence, the sphere of equivalence is much larger than what is suggested by the five gray physical dose at one centimeter. So that the proof of the pudding really is in the eating in terms of the randomized evidence. So there are um, large numbers of patients in the trial and it is 20 gray at surface that you should remember rather than what is further down at one or two centimeters. And the volume is not that much more different. And the experiment about mice and men, and mice and women, sorry, may not translate completely in women. The experiment that I showed you yesterday was real tissue fluid from women put on, uh, on cell lines. So it was not put in back in women, which was, would not be ethical, but it was not an experiment in vitro. It was an experiment in vivo. The fluid was taken from women after they had surgery although it was put on petri dishes after that. So let me show you a few slides in which, this one? Oh, now you, you messed up this as well now. <laughs> <laughs> this is cheating. Anyway, so we had, we don't have to even talk about this. You see, we know that target works. There has been an accusation that this is like a light bulb. But clearly, when you give it at the wrong place, at the wrong time, it doesn't work. So we have, within the trial, uh, internal control. So if you give it to scar tissue, it doesn't work. The dose that is given at the right time at the right place works. And it is not that these patients who were in the target group, who were randomized to target, just because some of them received whole breast radiotherapy, we have treated the worst patients with whole breast radiotherapy. As you can see here, the pre-pathology patients who received target alone, in fact, had worse disease and had more deaths from breast cancer than those who were in the post-pathology group. But despite that, when we should have had about six or seven percent recurrence rates, we target, we had only 2.7 percent. So now I'm going to make peace. So when might post-op APBI be better? Okay, so these are the reasons where I would like to help Professor Weser, or Dr. Weser, when uh, APBI might be better. So firstly, most importantly, I believe that there should be randomized evidence to support it. And I hope uh, Dr. Vicini and colleagues, their randomized trial does provide that evidence. So, but that, that will be evidence to show that it is better than external beam, not against target. So only when you do a randomized trial of target versus APBI, when you should choose APBI. Imagine having all those hundreds of wires in the breast. Horrible. Come on. <laughs> so just. I can't believe anybody would want to do that and have it. So firstly, you have to prove it in the randomized trial, and then do it if some surgeon has not heard of target and has done a lumpectomy already. So he has done the mistake. Now you clear, rectify it. You can give APBI if you have proven randomized evidence that it works. Secondly, if the hospital can't even provide target, a simple, straightforward solution. OK, use APBI. Buy a more expensive machine. So somebody who has more money than uh, what could be, uh, what is necessary. Thirdly, the surgeon and the radiation oncologist don't get along. The radiation oncologist doesn't want to go to the operation theater. Scrubs, waiting around for the anesthetist. No, no we will do a PBI. Let it be afterwards. It doesn't have to be, you, you can take many mistakes, putting the wire in the right place. In the, <laughs> oh, just do it simply. But you can't do it in theater, do it afterwards. Clinicians strongly believe in conventional dogma and do not wish to change practice based on randomized evidence. Then go ahead. Please use APPI. Okay, don't be insulted, please. <laughs> <laughs> and patient demands many days of treatment rather than a single dose in the operation theater. Go ahead. Please do APBI. So therefore, there are definitely at least five reasons or six reasons I could come up with when APBI should be better than target interbeam. So 
Until then, please use Target. There is an app. Is there an app for APBI? <laughs> no, you don't even have an app. <laughs> so use an app. It's on Apple as well as Android. Download it, call Target and Target Decision and use it. And that is the vision, moving to reality. It is not evil. It is nice. Do I look evil to you? <laughs> I, have a, I even have a curl on my ear, just like Superman. <laughs> so all patients over the 45, ERPR positive, let them receive Target, let us be friends, and for others, put them in a randomized trial to test whether giving intraoperative boost, whatever the technique, is superior to give an external boost given much later after chemotherapy. So target B uses intrabeam, test it in other systems. But don't treat 40,000 patients without being in randomized trial. Please, let's be friends. I think <laughs> we are at peace. And I know that he's going to get the last word, so. <laughs> that was a very nicely done rebuttal, Dr. Wazer. It was. It was a terrific rebuttal. And again, I thank you, Jay. Um, it was, it's very, very hard to, to come back uh, to answer that. Now, um, you know, I, I have a residency program, and uh, uh, often I, uh, I'll get at least one resident a year who wants to go into an academic career and will come to me and say, you know, what's the key to, a, to be a successful clinical academician? And, um, any field, but radiation oncology or surgery or uh, any field. So I give him Wazer's first rule of success in clinical trial uh, research, <laughs> and that if, if you are careful in patient selection, you will always get a good result. Both arms have the same <laughs> patients. <laughs> especially if you select patients who probably don't need treatment in the first place. So let's, so Jay, um, you slice and dice this data so much, my, my, it gives me a brain cramp. Um, so uh, let's focus on what you've published. Where did the 4% come from? Okay, so let's look at what you've published. And here's down on the bottom is the target A trial. And median age It's 2%, of, not 4. It's a median, type of median age of 63 years. <laughs> uh, T size, um, more than 86%, less than 2 centimeters. Um, depending upon which arm in the randomization, 82 to 84 percent node negative. ER positive, over 90 percent of patients. Tamoxifen given to two-thirds of the cohort, both arms. Now, here's the, the really wicked part, is all the bad actors were plucked out with external beam radiation therapy, and they were still counted You missed my slide. Shh, 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 shh. Now, you had your chance. So, <laughs> Here we have a cohort of patients now trending out with your published data to 4% failure at five years. Let's compare that not to brachytherapy, not to whole beam radiation therapy, but to no radiotherapy. And here's three randomized trials, no radiotherapy, similar patient populations to that which is in the target trial, uh, and like with target trial, uh, receiving tamoxifen. So, Jay talks about the Kevin Hughes trial. They didn't get nothing. They got tamoxifen, and radiotherapy still reduced failure in that low-risk patient population. And here we see basically comparable results, no radiotherapy compared to target. So we look at his results, and we see that in the prospectively randomized cohort of patients, we're seeing a pros progressive rise in the local failure rate. And we know that this failure rate is going to continue to rise. Now, we again see this slicing and dicing of the data that, well, if we go back and we take the, those bad Australians out and what the, the, the Danes or some of those lousy Danes get them out, then we get good results. But, you know, just don't get it done in Australia. And the other thing is um, look at the pre pathology progesterone receptor status. That will pick out the, the patients who are appropriate for target. Pre-specified. Right. So, Jay, uh, now with the, again, my head is spinning now, it says, well, now use tar target cautiously um, and use the eligibility criteria and make sure they're PGR positive uh, uh, up front. And then, of course, if you make a mistake, just add whole breast and then get fat necrosis in my breast. So, again, what? 
<laughs> now, I'm sure your statisticians pulled you aside and said that this is not kosher. The target trial randomization was not pre-stratified for progesterone receptor status. In fact, Jay, in your published material, I can't find any information at all related to the PR status in your population of patients. This is retrospective data phishing. It's a invalid statistical technique. It uses a non-stratified variable and is statistically invalid. The conclusion that PR status can safely select target patients is not scientifically valid, and his statisticians <laughs> we'll know that. The other factor is that, you know, PR status, now that selects out the good actors. Well, Jay, we know that. We know that molecular phenotype predicts outcome. Kind of doesn't matter what you do. If you pick out luminal A patients, you're going to get a good result. And that's what you're doing. You're picking out luminal A patients. So intra-op is highly dependent upon patient selection. Clearly so. And you're, again, your colleagues in Italy have driven this point home. As they've looked at their own data, looking at both the ASTRO consensus criteria and the uh, ESTRO, GEC ESTRO consensus criteria, as they break their data down, highly statistically significant. They get okay results in the lowest risk patients. But as risk increases, they get unacceptably high rates of local failure. So intra-op is highly dependent upon patient selection. And therefore, it's really only appropriate for women who have such a low risk of recurrence that they could consider no radiation therapy at all. In fact, they fall pretty much into the category of these multiple trials that have looked at tamoxifen therapy alone for these patients. You cannot escape the reality of the pathologic anatomy of breast cancer. As much as Jay tries to diminish that, that's the reality of treating breast cancer. And brachytherapy works irrespective of patient selection exactly because of that point. And when we look at multiple studies that have evaluated this, and I'll look at just the largest one uh, with over 2,000 patients, again, taking the ASTRO consensus criteria, absolutely no difference in in-breast recurrence rates irrespective of the risk stratification category. That's a function of a therapy that is based on the pathologic anatomy of the breast cancer. So, Jay, I'm stuck with this issue. I, you know, I think it is, we're on such different planets. Is it, is it this really transatlantic I give you independence. <laughs> I just, I'm so confused by this. So, um, in uh, August, I, I went to London, and I, I had put this, uh, this slides show together, and I, I would just randomly pick people off the street, and I made my presentation, because I thought, you know, is this an English thing or an American thing? Am I, am I just not speaking a thing? So... Uh, you know, here, one woman on the street um, said, you know, brachytherapy, two bloody thumbs up. I think she's a government employee of yours. Um, very pleasant, uh, but she, she got it. And uh, with respect to interop, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, what bar me is crazy. Is that right? Yeah, right. So that's, that's the response. You need to I see got. his teeth. Yeah. Right. So with that, I urge you to enjoy Las Vegas. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you. Factual letters. There's been a challenge on the factual uh, aspects of your, some of your talk, Dr. Weiser, but I'm afraid that based on the time that we have, <laughs> I've got, well, I think, one slide left in mine. Would you, would you not treat patients over 45 suitable for target A trial with any radiotherapy? This is what you suggested. I, I, the patients suitable for target A trial were so well selected that they would have same results without radiotherapy. So from henceforth, many of you may pack your offices, close your offices, and no radiotherapy for those patients. Over 45, up to three and a half centimeters, ERPR positive, no, they don't need radiotherapy, as per Professor Weza. Jay, you're, you're confused, Jay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's Questions? Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Weza. Uh, you know, I'm a surgeon. I've done IORT and I've done APBI. I make a lumpectomy cavity. And if I did APBI, 
I would put the balloon in that lumpectomy cavity. When I do IORT, I put the balloon in the lumpectomy cavity. Can you explain to me how there's a difference in, in a pathologic assessment between those two techniques? Oh, well, no, there's, there's not. And, uh, uh, you know, a, and it goes to a point of, uh, I think there are limitations to, again, using the lumpectomy cavity as the target definition for any form of uh, post-op therapy. But the nature of these single entry catheters is that it's a requirement that they have to go into the lumpectomy cavity. What's different uh, by using an iridium source is you are prescribing the tumoricidal dose to a distance away from the lumpectomy cavity that is at least one centimeter. When you use an intra-op uh, device, you are essentially doing, for lack of a better word, radiocautery. You give a massive radiation dose to the walls of the lumpectomy cavity, but at that same point at one centimeter, it is an inadequate dose to control the cancer. And it works. One, one other comment. Uh, I'm also a student of biology since I am a surgeon. And it seems to me that with the advent of hypofractionation, with the advent of the change in the alpha-beta ratio for tumors, don't you think that right now we're sort of on shaky ground as to some of the suppositions that we might have had regarding the ability to tumor kill with doses? I, I believe that if you uh, listen to radiobiologists, they feel that hyperfractionation is much more effective at, ki at killing cells than a uh, delivered yeah. Uh, yeah, dose. I'm not quite sure what your point is, because when you look at these hyperfractionated whole breast radiotherapy regimens, uh, these are calculated to be iso-effective, that is, that they, are, uh, they uh, give the same biological dose. Uh, that is still a substantial dose to the entire breast, just given with larger daily fractions over a shorter time period. It's not less radiation, it's not giving less radiation to a less, less geographic area, uh, it's biologically equivalent. You can't compare hypofractionated whole breast it's a single fraction in drop. You just can't. And the results speak for themselves. The Italians are seeing higher local failure. Target is seeing higher local failure. Sorry. We didn't. I, I, I believe that <laughs> I believe patient selection is extraordinarily important with anything we do. However, I do believe that the question of the effect, the radiobiologic effect of hypofractionation is going to become more and more elucidated as we go forward. And, and I really don't feel that a lot of the, the logarithmic, uh, formulaic uh, approach to radiation biology that's been used in the past will necessarily stand the test of time with modern day uh, clinical evidence. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? So I have one last slide. We're going to take a hand vote because I don't have any of those fancy little things. Ah, so you're going to count. Huh? I am. I'm going to count. I Very impartially. And let's make it clear. I get to count. Yeah. <laughs> so, for a show of hands, the winner of this year's grand debate is Mr. Evil Idea. Show of hands. Okay. 58. <laughs> Or is it Dr. Dr. Danger Wazer? Ah, I wonder if the same vote would hold true in England. I don't know. <laughs> I, I went over there you and already I, I <laughs> already did it. Uh. Okay, this has been great. I want to thank our uh, debaters and our audience and appreciate your comments uh, and questions. Um, do we have? So keeping uh, with uh, keeping us on schedule, we actually uh, have a break right now. Um, so let's take a break, and then we'll reconvene at 10:15. Uh, at 10:15, Dr. Patel has uh, come, and he will uh, uh, give us some more information. So thank you very much.